يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد all thanks and praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I thank Him and I praise Him. And I seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I seek refuge in Him from the evil within our own selves and from our bad deeds. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, no one can lead astray. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides, no one can guide. And I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. Welcome to your episode, Quran in Depth. This program is intended for us to look closely into the Quran. The best speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a mandatory thing for each and every one of us to look closely to the Quran, to the book of Allah. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a final message, as a final message to mankind. There is no more Prophet to be sent. And that's why this is the living miracle that every Muslim should witness. Actually, every human being should witness this last miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a miracle that a person can hear it, a person can ponder over it, and we would see clearly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected and made this speech a miraculous speech because it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the previous episodes we talked about the importance of the Qur'an in our life and the virtues of the Qur'an, the verses in the Qur'an, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that talks about the virtues of the Qur'an and how it is important for us to take the Qur'an seriously. This is the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, are we given the Qur'an its rights? Are we taking care of the Qur'an, having the nasiha and the sincere concern that this is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how are we going to hold fast to it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us in the Qur'an and as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered us in many hadiths to hold fast to the Qur'an and to the way of the Prophet alayhi wa salatu wa salam because we are not created except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and this is the only way that we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by submitting ourselves, by being Muslims, submitting ourselves to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet ﷺ. We talked about the importance of pondering over the verses of the Qur'an, that this is not something optional. This is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلْيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ That this is a book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. For what purpose? For them to ponder over it. For them to look closely into the words of Allah. For what reason? For that a person would get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from him. Not what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from everybody else. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from each and every one of us. A message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every single person individually so that we submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get to this level, we need to read the Qur'an. We need to understand the meanings of the Qur'an. 
But we need to do, as we mentioned before, something to our hearts. We need to clean our hearts for it to be ready to accept the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you remember the quote from Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, the companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the third khalifa, when he said, لَوْ طَهُرَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مَا شَبِعْتُمْ مِنْ كَلَامِ رَبِّكُمْ If your hearts are pure, if the heart are, is pure, the heart is pure, then the person would never be satisfied, would never would say, this is enough when it comes to the words of Allah, the Qur'an. We would constantly want to know, want to recite, want to ponder over the Qur'an as a result of the hearts being clean. So it's not just that a person is sitting explaining the Qur'an and this is our work. We need to work on ourselves individually. We need to work on our hearts to clean it from all forms of impurities, from anything that is the hearts are being attached to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that is of a form of a sin, disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be constant in the state of repentance, of tawbah, that we need to be always in that state of tawbah, cleaning ourselves so that we, ben- we can benefit from the Qur'an. So this program is the part that we need to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We might get to know this by any language, but we would still miss something, miss the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, and the Qur'an was spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that fits His Majesty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is the like of Him, but as we know the Qur'an is in the Arabic language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Arabic language for the Qur'an to be revealed and to stay like this till the Day of Judgment, to be preserved. And that's why it's something that we will talk about, inshallah, in the last segment of the program, the importance of the Arabic language. But before that, I would... Uh, ask you to, if you have any questions, to send uh, emails uh, to us. We need to have the Qur'an as an interaction, something that we would learn, something that we, if we have any questions, we ask. We don't leave ourselves like this, just reciting Qur'an for the purpose of getting rewards. We need to be more serious. We need to deal with every verse. This is a miracle. This is a treasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how are we going to use this treasure? How are we going to learn it? How are we going to utilize it in our lives so that every verse in the Qur'an can be a lead for us to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that we need to concentrate to understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, in this program, I would ask you to be still patient. Inshallah, next time we'll uh, talk more uh, about the explanations of the Qur'an. But... Still, some of the principles that we need to concentrate on. These are foundations. We mentioned some of these foundations so that once we start with the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not have to refer back to the principles in details again. So this is very important that we set the foundation, the principles that we need to understand when it comes to the explanation of the Qur'an. We mentioned that the best way to make the tafsir and the explanation of the Qur'an is to explain the Qur'an by the Qur'an. And to explain the Qur'an by the Sunnah, by the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And we talked about that last time, and how there is a relationship between the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that they are both revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to the submission, we do not differentiate between the Qur'an and the way of the Prophet ﷺ. We submit ourselves totally to the Qur'an and to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And... The third category of how to understand the Qur'an is through the way of the companions of Allah. So there are five things actually, and this is something that Ibn Kathir rahimahullah he mentioned. The Qur'an explains the Qur'an, the Sunnah explains the Qur'an, the sayings of the companions radiallahu anhum, the sayings of the tabi'een, the next generation, the second generation after the companions radiallahu anhum, and the Arabic language. Remember these five points very well because this is our methodology in trying to explain what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. We talked about the first two principles. Today, inshallah, tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about the rest and some more points as it will come, inshallah ta'ala. Why is it important for us to understand the Qur'an like the companions of Allah? You would hear in the program when we start reciting the verses of the Qur'an and trying to explain it, that we would say, قَالَ ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما. That Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما said that this verse means such and such, or this word means such and such. 
that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an said such and such. These are companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Why is it important for us to keep mentioning their ways of explaining the Qur'an? Because they are the best people ever brought to mankind after the messengers of Allah. After the Prophets, the level right after the Prophets is the level of the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an that He is pleased with them, they are pleased with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them to be the companions of the Prophet wasalam, they took the Qur'an from the mouth of the Prophet wasalam, fresh. They were the first generation, the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them. And the ones that took the explanation of the Qur'an from the mouth of the Prophet wasalam, that's why they have the best and the most authentic way of explaining the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially, that the Prophet ﷺ praised them, that before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them. The Prophet ﷺ, the most perfect among the human beings, والسلام, he made dua, supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, his nephew, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him comprehend this religion and make him learn the matters of the tafsir or the explanation of the Qur'an. When the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma faqihu fi din wa'allimhu ta'wil that, O oh Allah, make him comprehend the religion and make him learn the ta'wil, the tafsir, the explanation of the Qur'an. Also, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anh, the one that he said, Wallahi, swearing by the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no verse unless I know when it was revealed, where it was revealed, and of course the explanation of it. And he said, if I know that someone knows a tafsir, an explanation of a verse, that I do not know, I would travel to him to the furthest distant. This is the way that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said. And they had students after them, which is the tabi'een. So the explanation of the companions, the understanding of the companions of the Prophet sallam, the practical nature of the Qur'an, because we need to know how to interact with the Qur'an, how to learn the knowledge, and how to apply it in our times. And when we see the ways of the companions of Allah, how they applied the verses of the Qur'an, how they understood it with the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and with the sayings of the ulama, this is the way for us to be able to live the Qur'an. The Prophet wasallam, as we know from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that when he, she was asked about the mannerism of the Prophet wasallam, she said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran," That his mannerism was the Qur'an. The question is, is our mannerism, is the Qur'an? Are we the Qur'an walking meaning, we're abiding by the orders of Allah? How can we do that if we do not know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us in the Qur'an? So forgive me for repeating this over and over again, but maybe it would get us more excited and enthusiasm that we need to get to know, so that we apply the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have the effect in our hearts when it comes to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the companions, radiallahu anhum, how they understood the Qur'an, this is something that we would mention when it comes to the explanation of the Qur'an. And also, number four, uh, the understanding, the sayings of the tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, they spread throughout the land, teaching the people the Qur'an and the way of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. They had students, those who learned from them, and these students, they became scholars in the religion of Islam, and they explained that to the next generation, and from one generation to the other, we have this best lineage. Till nowadays, this is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected it. If you look at any language throughout the face of earth, changes happens to it. The Arabic language, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected it. If any Muslim knows Arabic, if he opens Tafsir ibn Kathir, if he opens the Qur'an and recite the Qur'an, you would see that we would understand the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is the miraculous nature of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the tabi'een, someone like Al-Qama for example, or Mujahid, that Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah, one of the great scholars of the early generations of Islam, he said if you hear the tafsir, if you get to know the tafsir, the explanation of a verse from Mujahid, Ibn Jabr, then don't ask about it. That means you've been given enough. This is enough for you to get to know what he said. Why? Because he got it 
strayed directly from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So Quran explains the Quran, the Sunnah explains the Quran, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum explains the Quran, the Tabi'een explains the Quran, and the fifth one is the Arabic language that we'll talk about inshallah ta'ala later in the program. So please don't forget these principles. This is what we would follow inshallah ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity and to make us among those who are the people of the Qur'an. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to comprehend the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act according to the Qur'an. We'll be right back inshallah ta'ala. So see you in a few minutes inshallah. So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Welcome back. The Quran, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the principles that we need to adhere to after learning that we'll go through the five principles. Quran explains the Quran, the Sunnah explains the Quran, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ explains the Quran, and the Tabi'een, the next generation, and the Arabic language. When it comes to the Arabic language, it's important for us to understand that the Quran is miraculous by nature. It's miraculous. Why? Because it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the miraculous nature of the Qur'an is not just in one aspect, not just in the linguistic aspect, although this is the most important aspect of the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, but it's also in the rulings that are mentioned in the Qur'an, in the things that are mentioned in the Qur'an that are unseen to us, whether it's something of revelation that speaks about matters of the future, or matters of the hereafter, and so on and so forth. Also, the miraculous nature that is in the Qur'an with regarding to the scientific meanings and the uh, aspects of the Qur'an that is altogether is miraculous by nature. Why? Because it's the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's miraculous because the one that spoke the Qur'an is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we need to witness that. But the important thing is for us to witness this, to witness it in the most perfect way, we need to learn the language of the Qur'an. Someone might say, but we're not Arabs. We don't have to learn the Arabic language. It might be true that we don't have to learn the Arabic language to perfect it, to be good Muslims. There are certain parts or certain amount of the language that is mandatory for each and every one of us to learn. To be able to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. This is a mandatory thing. For a person to be a Muslim, we have to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Believing in it with our hearts only is not enough unless a person speaks it out if he's able to speak, of course. And it won't benefit if the person would just believe in the heart with the first pillar of Al Islam. So we have to know that. We have to know the meaning of La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That you bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. So this is a mandatory part that we're supposed to learn in the Arabic language. Also when we perform the salah which is the second pillar of Islam, we have to speak some Arabic. We have to say Allahu Akbar. We have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And if a person embraced Islam and he does not know the Arabic language immediately, that might take some time. It's okay, he still or she still can perform the salah can say subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar, till the person learns the basics in the salah, in the prayers. So, takes a week, takes few days, whatever there is, but eventually, every Muslim should be able to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. This is a pillar in the salah. Without reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, the salah is not valid. So when we say, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, this is Quran. 
But if you say all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of all that exists, that's not Qur'an. This is translation of the Qur'an. That won't benefit the person to say that in the salah. We have to say it in the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, because alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen is a miracle. But all praise and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is just for you to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, the meaning of it. So learning a certain portion of the Arabic language becomes mandatory on every Muslim. But if you have a higher zeal, if you have the ability, if you have the time to give, to learn the language of the Qur'an, definitely don't waste your life. Don't waste your life without learning this beautiful language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen for the last revelation. This is the language that unites us as Muslims. For us to be able to interact with one another, this is one thing, but what is more important is for us as Muslims, when we open the book of Allah, we recite the Qur'an so that we get the rewards and also to ponder over the verses of the Qur'an so that we recite and listen and hear to the miracle directly. As you know that every messenger was sent, he was sent with a miracle for people to see with their own eyes. And people saw the miracles from every messenger. It's easy to invite people to believe that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because almost every human being, except those who are atheists, the human being by nature, in his heart, they understand and they believe in the existence of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is the creator, the provider and so on. So when you come and invite someone to la ilaha illallah, for the human being to believe that the only one worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Since he's the creator, since he's the provider, since he's the sustainer, then turn to him alone, pray to him alone, worship him alone. So this is a part that every human being should accept definitely. But then when it comes to the part of making them believe in the messengers of Allah, making them believe in some human beings as messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this might be or have some difficulties from some of the human beings. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the messengers. He sent them with miracles. That people at their lifetime, they saw the miracles with their own eyes. As we know, Musa alayhi salam, the miracle with his stick that, for example, split the sea. And imagine you are with the people of Musa alayhi salam. And if a person has a doubt, for example, that Musa alayhi salam was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once they saw the sea split by the action of Musa alayhi salam, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they have no excuse whatsoever. The miracle is clear in front of them. Something that a human being can never perform. Something that comes in, in a challenge form that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided the messengers. The same thing with Salih, with Isa, with Jesus, peace be upon all of the messengers. And also Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When the disbelievers, they asked the Prophet ﷺ for a miracle, and he pointed at the moon and it was split into two halves. This is something that a human being is not able to do, that has to prove that he's a messenger of Allah, that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do that. The same thing with the water gushing from the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. The, uh, the trunk of the tree that was moaning and crying as a result of the Prophet ﷺ, abandoned it and made the khutbah and the, uh, the talk, the sermon, on the pulpit, on the mimbar, instead of the tree. The tree was weeping. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they heard that. And many of the miracles that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they saw with their own eyes. And they narrated that to the next generation, and the next generation narrated to the next generation, and so on. But what happened to the nations before the Prophet ﷺ? Those who believed, they believed, whether they saw the miracle or not. And those who came after them, generations after that, they didn't see this miracle. So what happened? They don't believe in it anymore. So since the Prophet ﷺ was the final messenger of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided him with miracles that people can see with their own eyes in his lifetime, like all the messengers before. But to add to this, the biggest miracle, the miracle that people can hear, can listen from one generation to the other. So you have the living miracle for people to come after the Prophet ﷺ and prove to themselves that he is the final messenger of Allah when they look closely to the Qur'an, the words of Allah ﷻ. They would discover for themselves 
that the Quran itself is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a miracle, the meaning of a mu'jiza or miracle, that it has a challenge to mankind. If all mankind are not able to do this miracle, that means the person that performed the miracle, he's on the truth. If someone had a, said something that is a miraculous nature, and he challenges the human beings, and that came in the sense of challenging them, then they are not on the truth till they do something like he did. And he is on the truth because he brought this challenge to them. The Qur'an is the living miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged human beings and jinn and all that exists to bring something like the Qur'an. If they all get together, كُلَّ إِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا مِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا That if the jinn and the human beings, they get together, imagine all the human beings getting together, to work on one thing, one project, and that is to bring something the like of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, they won't be able to bring something the like of the Qur'an. This is a challenge. The challenge is still valid. Not just at the time of the Prophet wasallam. it's still the day of judgment. Can the human being do that today? If they want to prove that the Qur'an is not the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bring something the like of it in the same miraculous nature that the Qur'an is in. They won't be able to do that. And the challenge was even made easier for them. If they have a doubt, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, bring something like 10 surahs, 10 chapters of the Qur'an. And they were not able to do that. And then the challenge made even easier. Bring the like of one surah, one chapter. The smallest surah in the Qur'an, إِنَّ أَعْطَنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرِ فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَانْحَرْ إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرِ Did you hear how long that took? You can fit it in one line. One line that if you write it down, it fits one line. This is a miraculous nature to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the human beings and all that exists to bring the like of just that. Just one surah, one chapter of the Quran. And nobody is able to do that. And no one will be able to do that. Because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. This is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that means what? That means the Qur'an is the words from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to witness the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. First, in its linguistic power, and this is the main miracle of the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ was sent to people, to the people of Quraysh, to the Arab at the time, and to all mankind. But when the Prophet ﷺ was sent among the Arab, and the Qur'an is in their language, they reached the peak and the perfectness in mastering the Arabic language. They wrote poets that are amazing. And don't take my words for it. If you study the Arabic language, you would see that for yourself. You would see how much rich is the language, the Arabic language, and how they use this language in a so much powerful way that you would think this is not the words of a human being. When you would see someone, for example, among the poets of the times of ignorance, writing 150 lines of poetry, describing the eyes of a camel, for example. And each line is different than the line before. How much richness that is. And you would read it and you would be amazed of how beautiful sounds that is with the poetry and so on. And then the Qur'an was revealed unto them and they could not bring the like of it. Even the disbelievers, as it's mentioned in the, in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and others, they even, some of them, they prostrated, they made sujood, when they heard the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Al-Najm and the sajda in it, they made sujood when they heard these miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although they did not believe, but they did not believe it because of other reasons, because of the prejudice nature that they had, because of the enmity towards the people of Quraysh or to the, towards the Prophet ﷺ, arrogance that deprived them from seeing the truth. But they realized this is not the words of a human being. The linguistic power and the nature of the Qur'an that is miraculous, how can we taste this? We won't be able to do that in such a program that we speak in it within, in the English language. But we should benefit definitely by getting to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Also we can get some of these meanings, some of the understanding of how power that is when it comes to the linguistic power and miraculous nature of the Qur'an. So maybe some of us would learn the Arabic language with the intentions that he want to understand directly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. The Qur'an 
is the miracle of the religion of Islam. So one thing that we would get, we would get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, but we might miss the effect that the Qur'an would have on our hearts in a full effect, of course, when we do not listen to it, the Arabic language, when we don't have this direct understanding. So this is a call to each and every one of us to spend the time to learn the Arabic language, to teach it to our children. If you missed it and you are in old age, don't make the chance miss your children. Make them learn the Arabic language from early age. We need to have and form schools that teach the Arabic language. At a time when there's so much tribulations and trials, it's something mandatory for us to hold fast to the religion of Islam. To have this connection from us to the Qur'an, we need to teach ourselves and our children how to recite the Qur'an. And not just reciting, many Muslims do that, mashallah, but also to understand the Qur'an, to comprehend the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that we are closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by understanding this miraculous nature of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one aspect. Another aspect is the rules mentioned in the Qur'an. Perfect rules. Perfect way of life. That if people would ponder over it, they would see how this religion of Islam ruled the Muslims throughout generations with this perfect way of life. Also mannerism with the verses of the Qur'an that calls the people to all that is perfect, to forgive one another, to be kind to one another in a perfect way, to call for justice and to enjoy good and to forbid evil. Also matters of the unseen things to be uh, mentioned about the future. Inshallah we'll talk about that when we get into the verses of the Qur'an. Also the miraculous nature in the Qur'an within the verses of the Qur'an that talks about beliefs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship, and so on and so forth. So every verse in the Qur'an is a treasure. Every verse in the Qur'an that speaks about a miracle in itself, and we need to have the time to learn it, and to discuss it, and then the effect of the Qur'an will be definitely present in our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us comprehend the Qur'an, and we'll be right back with the last segment, and answering some of your questions that were sent uh, through the email. Be right there. Twitter TV has taken another step towards delivering its very informative programs to a wider international audience. For the first time in an effort to bring our programming to Europe, Huda TV is now broadcasting on Hotbird. Our viewers can now watch Huda TV according to the following perimeters. Hotbird, 8, 13 degrees east. Frequency, 11566. Polarization, horizontal. Symbol rate 27500. FEC 3 over 4. Huda TV, a light in every home. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Welcome back. Before uh, answering uh, the questions that we received uh, through the emails, uh, I would like to remind you, inshallah ta'ala, next time we'll start with the explanation of the Qur'an. We'll start with, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, and then Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And even if we take some time, but this is something that we say all the time. We say it all the time, every time we recite the Qur'an, so we need to get to understand what it means, what's the effect of that in our hearts, and how can we live accordingly, and how that should affect our lives actually. Because every verse we learn should have an effect in our lives, and should get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, brother Abu Malik from Nigeria, he sent a question asking about the whispers that a person would get in his heart. Are we asked or questioned in the Day of Judgment? We will be responsible for the whims and the whispers that a person would get 
or are we responsible only for the physical actions that we do? To answer this question, because we mentioned a few episodes before about the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, and we mentioned a hadith in it of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the companions radiallahu anhum with the third verse before last in Surah Al-Baqarah. And you can refer back to it. And again, this is something good that we all do. That go back to the Qur'an, open the Qur'an, read it, see the translation. And this is another question. What's the best translation for us to use when it comes to understanding the Qur'an? Read the verse in Arabic so that you don't deprive yourself from the rewards by reciting every letter in the Qur'an is equal to ten rewards as the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, la akul alif lam mim harf, walakin alif un harf, walam un harf, wa mim un harf. That alif lam mim, just by saying alif lam mim, which is the first verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, this is not one letter. Alif is one letter, lam is one letter, mim is one letter. That means by reciting this, that doesn't take much time, a person would get 30 rewards. One hasana, one reward, is better than this whole world and whatever it contains. This life that we live in, Time is so precious. How can we utilize the time so that we do not regret it in the Day of Judgment? How much time that we waste and how much injustice that we commit to ourselves? We'll give you an example. If you have a child, for example, that finds a piece of a diamond, a big piece of diamond, for example, and he doesn't see the, the, the value of it. And it seems to him like a piece of glass. So he walks in the street with this piece of glass and uh, a jeweler would ask him, let me see this. And he would tell him, can I give you $100 for it and you give it to me? The child will be very happy with it, with the $100. But if he realized the value of what he's carrying with him, he won't be satisfied with the $100. Imagine how much valuable things we have in our life. The most valuable thing in our life is the deen of Allah, the deen of Islam. The most valuable thing in our life is the book of Allah, the Qur'an. So that every letter we recite is equal to 10 rewards. One reward is better than this whole world and whatever it contains. Life is too short. And that's why we need to utilize every second of it in what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we do that? It doesn't mean that a person would isolate himself or herself to recite Quran all day and all night. This is not the way of the Prophet But how can we get to know the way of the Prophet we need to learn the Qur'an. And we need to have the patience to learn the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam so that we utilize our times in the best way and the, and, and the way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once you open and you recite the verse, then read the explanation of it. So the third verse before last in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in it, وَإِن تُبْدُوا مَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ تُخْفُوا يُحَاسِبُكُمْ بِهِ الله. فيغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء والله على كل شيء قدير ذات لله ما في السماوات ما في الأرض of course it starts with that that to Allah سبحانه وتعالى belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth and if you show something or you conceal it Allah سبحانه وتعالى knows about it and you will be held accountable for it so this verse when it was revealed as we mentioned before the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم they went to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and they fell into their knees and they said O Prophet of Allah we have been ordered to make salah, and to pay zakah, and to perform jihad, fighting in the cause of Allah, and all of that you are capable of doing. But this verse, we're not able to fulfill it in the most perfect way. Because it means that your whims, your whispers, you will be held accountable with whatever thoughts that comes into your mind. The Prophet ﷺ told them, would you like to be like the nations before when they said we listen and we disobey? Say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا Say, we listen and we obey. وَفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ The narrator of the hadith when he said, فَلَمَّا ذَلَّتْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ when, when their tongues humbled itself with سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا They submitted themselves to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them because they realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, the most wise. As a result of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Go and read it and see what the benefit from it you would see that in it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He would not have a burden on the human beings, something that they cannot bear, and one of which, our thoughts. So that means, we are not questioned by the thoughts that comes into our minds, as long as it's not translated into actions. And this is also the Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved this ummah from what a person would speak to himself about. The thoughts that comes into our minds. We know that the shaitan whispers. And a person can get thoughts into his own mind. This is not something that we will be held accountable with regarding to this, as long as it's nothing but thoughts. Once a person make a decision, once a person have the strong intention to commit something, if it's a sin, then the person needs to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once a person do something physically, then if it's something that is a sin, a person needs to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that says if a person have the intentions that he would do a good deed and he doesn't do it, he would get a reward. And if a person have the intentions to do a good deed and he does it, he will get 10 other rewards. And if a person have the intentions to do a bad deed and he doesn't do it, then he will get one reward. And this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why a Muslim should constantly intend to do what is good. So in the hadith and in the verses as we heard, we won't be questioned when it comes to our thoughts. Only things that are done physically, things that we say with our tongues, we have to consider that what we say is actions. Some of us, we do not realize that words are actions. We think that actions is when you hit someone, when you move, when you walk, but also what we speak. A word can take the person outside the fold of Islam. If he says the word of disbelief, or curses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whatever, and there is sins that done by one's tongue, how much pain that a person can afflict to others as a result of not paying attention to what we say. So actions done physically, things that are being said, all of these things a person will be held accountable, and he has to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he commits a sin. But only thoughts, we need to push it away. Otherwise, if we don't push away the evil thoughts, what happens? That can be easily translated into actions and then the person will be held accountable with regarding to these thoughts. So once the whispers comes, a person should not take that and then act according to it and make it, uh, give it more thoughts and make decisions. No, we should push it away if it's something that is evil, something that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan. And this is even something that the companions of Allah anhum went to the Prophet والسلام, and they told him that sometimes they get some thoughts, they're not able to even say it. They would hate it so much because it's something that of disbelief, for example, comes into their minds. The Prophet وسلم, when he when he heard that, he said, You find this in yourself, This is this is Iman, this is the clear faith. Why is that? Because shaitan is throwing some whispers into your mind, and you hate it, that means this is not your belief. The human being, they have this tendency, that if they believe in something, they're proud of it. But if you feel that you hate it so much, makes you so much uncomfortable, gives you so much pain, when a thought of disbelief or something passes into your mind, then know for sure that this is not you. This is the shaitan had, through such a whisper in you, what to do, just push it away, don't think about it, Recite the Qur'an, make istighfar, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. And this is what we should do with the thoughts and the whispers and so on. But a person is not to be held accountable with only thoughts. But if it translates to actions, then this is where the responsibility is. The second question was about the best translation uh, to the verses of the Qur'an. Again, as we heard before, the Qur'an is the language of the Qur'an, the Arabic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose. So again, when we recite, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ This is Qur'an. But if we translate the meaning of it, this is not Qur'an. This is the explanation of the meaning of the Qur'an. Why do we need to translate the Qur'an? We need to translate the Qur'an. We need to speak like this, so that we get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. But this is not the Qur'an. This is the explanation of the Qur'an. To get the rewards, you have to recite the Qur'an, the exact same words that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. So yes, we need the translation, but again, a sincere advice, don't be just satisfied with the translation. Take it as a mean, and start learning the beautiful language of the Qur'an, so that we can comprehend the Qur'an, and we get closer to the Qur'an by relating to the Qur'an. Makes you love the Qur'an. Makes you love the companions عنهم, and the Prophet ﷺ even more. So this is not a particular language to a certain group of people. This is the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the final revelation. And again, don't forget your children. Make them study the Arabic language. And make them comprehend the Qur'an when they're young in age, 
so that they would become a real bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unto you. So we need, yes, the translations of the Qur'an. When it comes to the English language, there are more than one translation. But one of the good translations, uh, the one uh, that uh, is famous as Sahih International, for example, or the one by uh, Dr. Muhsin Khan, these are good translations of the Qur'an because it translates the meanings. It translates the meanings and there's so much effort uh, in these translations to bring the most or the closest uh, uh, meanings of uh, the verses of the Qur'an. So use these types of translations and uh, do the best you can so that you would understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And again, by uh, getting to know that from someone that mastered the Arabic language makes a big difference. Uh, and that's why this is a mandatory thing for anybody that studies the knowledge and wants to be a scholar in the religion of Islam. We have to master the language of the Qur'an so that we'll be able to relate that to others in whatever language there is. But we also need to encourage people to learn the Qur'an and to learn the language of the Qur'an, the Arabic language of the Qur'an. Uh, also another point which is uh, very important for us when it comes to the language of the Qur'an, and I've seen this in many places, where people tend to uh, belittle the importance of uh, the Arabic language. And they think this is an issue of culture or something of that nature. We need to change uh, that opinion. We need to change this idea. And again, uh, the reason for that is to be able to live the Qur'an, to be affected by the miracle. Imagine, again, at the time of a messenger of Allah, you saw a miracle with your own eyes. How strong that is would make you firm and steadfast. Definitely, it would make a big difference. The same thing with the Qur'an. This is the miracle that was sent to the Prophet ﷺ for people to listen to it. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Qur'an. When the jinn was sent and they heard the Prophet ﷺ, they said, قَالُوا إِنَّ سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا That we heard an amazing, a unique Qur'an. We heard and we still can hear it. We still can listen to the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ did not write the Qur'an when it was revealed to him. He recited it, alayhi salatu wasalam. Did not edit it, the Qur'an. Did not say, wait, you know, keep this on the side till I review it and then we can edit it. This didn't happen. Once the Prophet ﷺ spoke it and the companions, radiallahu anhum, wrote it and they memorized it, this is the same Qur'an that we recite today, 1400 years after the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, it's the same Qur'an with its miraculous nature as we heard. So, learning the Arabic language, it's something that would make the person comprehend this miracle. As if you are living at the times of the messengers, and you're seeing the miracle with your own eyes, but instead you would recite it, you would hear it with your own ears. Some people say if we were living at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the matter would have been easier for us. This is not a valid excuse. Actually, a person one time, he said that in front of Hudayfa, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the early generation of Islam said that to him. And he said that this is not valid for, for such a person to say that. Why? Because the companions, عنهم, they went through severe tests. And we do not know if we were be to be steadfast at these tests or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them. We have to witness the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for us to live. So we have to be pleased with the qadr, with the destiny of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to witness the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. So as a result of that, we can witness with our own selves the miracle of the Qur'an. And this is something that definitely it would make a big difference if a person would learn the language of the Qur'an and to spend the time. It's worth it to spend years to learn the language of the Qur'an and to inculcate that in our children so that they hold fast to the Qur'an so that the language that we communicate with one another will be the language of the Qur'an by the will of Allah. When people go for Hajj, they see sometimes even most of the people they would speak English or French or whatever there is to one another, Muslims. But why can't we learn the language of the Qur'an from early ages so that our form of communication that would help for us to be one Ummah and for the uh, joy of this life to comprehend the Qur'an, to see the miracle in a daily basis when we recite the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is of course more important and what is mandatory, 
is to act according to the Quran. And this is, inshallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can get that by understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you in any language. And this is our job in this program, to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, so that we have no excuse, so that we can enjoy the Quran, and so that we can submit ourselves to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, next time we'll start with the Quran and to explain the verses from the Quran. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who benefit and recite the Quran and gain the rewards from the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. So till next time, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ يدبرون القرآن ولو كان من عند غير الله لوجدوا فيه اختلافا كثيرا